Let's use this terrible economic crisis to question assumptions behind economic theory and to rethink the role of the state, finance, and austerity in promoting growth and innovation. The best industrial policy is no industrial policy at all. Um, the implication um, of that view is that the role of the state, uh, whether in developing countries or developed countries, should be simply to provide a framework for markets, a framework of law and uh, contract enforcement, and also occasionally to fix clear market failure, but always with a very specific rationale for each intervention in the market. The assumption is that the market generally produces optimal results on its own, and therefore uh, any state intervention should be limited at fixing market failures um, and not go um, uh, beyond that. So that is the, the sort of orthodox view. Um, there is a what you could call heterodox uh, narrative which says that um, it is important for um, states to uh, intervene in an active way both to help um, nurture new industries, that is sun, sunrise industries, industries of the future, um, and also to help industries that are sunset industries that are going out of uh, being competitive in that economy, help them to exit so resources can be freed up. And this uh, heterodox narrative um, draws a lot of support from the experience of um, East Asia, uh, such as Japan, uh, Korea, and Taiwan. Um, I want to come back to the East Asian case in, in a minute, but before I get on to East Asia, th there's one basic and really important background point um, I want to make that I think both the, um, the orthodox narrative and the heterodox narrative miss. And that basic point is that the historical record shows that economic development is really, really difficult. And the central piece of evidence is this. Ask yourself how many uh, non-Western countries have become developed countries over the past 200 years, so not since the Second World War, over the past 200 years since the Industrial Revolution. And even if you use very expansive criteria of non-Western and expansive criteria of what is developed as distinct from developing, the answer to that question, how many non-Western countries have become developed countries over the past 200 years, is less than 10. And in fact, it's probably about seven, namely Japan, as starting in the mid-19th century with the Meiji Restoration, then Russia, uh, starting in the late um, 19th century, if you call Russia non-Western. Then you have uh, Korea and Taiwan and Singapore. You might add Hong Kong. Uh, then you have to add Israel. And that gives you seven. And it's very difficult to see another country that has a non-Western country that has become developed. So clearly there are things happening in the structure of the world economy. There are, there are processes in the structure of the world economy which make it very difficult for developing countries to become what we might call developed uh, uh, countries. There are, there are things uh, which are the analogues of gravity which are holding uh, countries down. And this applies uh, today very much to countries like Brazil and China, which many people think it's just a matter of time before they enter the ranks of the developed countries. I think that that would be a misreading of the historical record. Now, just back to East Asia. Um, most of the attention on East Asian industrial policy looks at the top level organizations and the development of plans for particular sectors. Um, and I think that that's certainly important. MITI, for example, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry in Japan, was certainly an important um, coordinating and um, promoting body of Japan's structural transformation after the Second World War. But 
to focus just on what is happening at the top um, misses a, a lot of activity that was going on at the grassroots, so to speak. And I want to refer to what happened in Taiwan, but um, Korea and Japan had similar equivalents. Taiwan had um, a, a small government agency called the Industrial Development Bureau, which had roughly 150 engineers. And these engineers functioned like an agricultural extension service, except, of course, they were working on industry. They were divided into sector teams. So there was a team for daily necessities, a team for chemicals and petrochemicals, a team, a team for metals, team for electronics, and so on. And the members of each team had to go out for several days a month as part of their job description and visit factories, visit firms within their sector. They then brought knowledge from the center and from what was happening in world markets in their sector to the firm, to the factory floor, but also they brought information about what was happening, what were problems at the factory floor. They brought that knowledge back to the center. Um, so there was a two-way flow of information. And what, what these people were doing all the time was nudging. This is not picking winners. This is because some picking winners was being done at the top level organizations, but this is at the grassroots. They were just nudging firms to keep um, upgrading, uh, to keep automating, to keep looking for new products, to keep um, trying to make contracts with the subsidiaries of foreign companies uh, working in Taiwan. Um, and and uh, it wasn't just that they kept advising the firms to do this. The Industrial Development Bureau engineers themselves were quite active in forcing marriages between, um, for example, um, a subsidiary of Philips that was making televisions in Taiwan and local Taiwanese firms uh, such that Philips received all kinds of pressures, pressures or nudges to switch um, its sources of supply for commodities, uh, for inputs like specialized glass to switch from some foreign supplier to a local Taiwanese supplier by giving the to Taiwanese supplier a long-term supply contract so that the Taiwanese could upgrade their equipment for making glass um, at relatively low risk. But the, the way that this was done in this particular case, the Industrial Development Bureau used inside channels to get the Board of Foreign Trade to start delaying Philips applications to import the specialized glass from which had been previously automatically quickly approved. Philips began to experience weeks of delays and through mechanisms of this kind, Philips got the message that it really would be better if they at least talked to the Taiwanese uh, to explore um, what the possibilities were and that's actually what happened. And so in this particular case, what happened was that the ca capabilities of uh, two Taiwanese glass makers were upgraded so that they could produce the same quality glass at the same, more or less the same price that Philips had been importing it at with help from Philips that Philips initially was unwilling to give. But they used this lever of the gov government um, requirement that all imports be approved, normally quite automatically, in order to put pressure on Philips. My point is that this kind of thing was going on at the grassroots in Taiwan industry from the 1950s decade after decade after decade, all the time you had these teams of people pushing Taiwanese firms um, and the subsidiaries of multinationals to link up together to make the input-output structure of the Taiwan economy denser and more diversified. So that is a very neglected part of the story, I think, of East Asian industrialization. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm the beginning of the Greek crisis. Now the question is then, how do you resolve this difficulty? And essentially, you need that. Um, Keynesian measure of, of various kinds. Or, to put it another way, in any case, you don't need austerity. Uh, austerity 
is bad for growth so, and is bad for uh, innovation. We were appalled. <laughs> we wrote a manifesto uh, saying that we were appalled. Because Certainly Europe is facing a number of enormous challenges with an, inc an increasing international competition. When we look at Europe per se, we see that many of those...